Well, hi, and welcome back to our study through Paul's letter to Philemon. And we're on lesson four today, working our way through this short little letter. And before we do anything else, let's stop and pray. Father, we thank you again that we have this letter in our Bibles, and we thank you that we have a Bible that is in our own language that we can read and understand and comprehend. And yet, Father, we realize that it still is a spiritual book and that we need the Holy Spirit to enable us to grasp it and understand and apply and live it. And so we pray, as we do every time, that you would be our teacher today. We pray that you would open our eyes, that we might behold wonderful things out of your law. And more than anything else, we pray that you would help us grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we go through this little letter to Philemon. And we ask these things in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen. Well, uh, as I said, we're in the, the little book of Philemon, and we've done a couple of introductory uh, lessons, and then we took a look at the first part of, of the little letter, which was Paul's greeting and introduction. And we're going to move on a little bit today. But let's do what we have been doing, and let's read through Paul's letter to Philemon together. So Philemon, uh, Paul writes, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints, and I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it, to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And that is Paul's short letter to Philemon. And I want to start today with something that may seem a little out of place, but it's really not. Um, it's, it's What I'm going to talk about here is not the point of the letter, but it will help get us there. So uh, this will help us get to the point, especially of the text that we're going to look at today. But I want to talk just real quick about uh, a question. The question is this, what is assurance of salvation. In other words, how do you know? What is assurance of salvation? How do you know you are saved? I think we can point biblically to four things, and I want to hit these fairly quickly. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but this will help because we're going to come back to these kinds of thoughts a little bit as we get into our text today. So what is assurance of salvation? A lot of scripture we could go to. Four basic observations on this. Uh, many verses with each one, but I'm just going to hit a couple, uh, lots more scripture uh, again that we could go to, but 
the first thing is uh, when we talk about assurance of salvation is the promises of God. The promises of God, we have to rest there. So Romans 1.16, Paul writes, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. We have that assurance that we can rest on. We go up to Romans chapter 10, verse 13. Paul simply says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So the first thing we have to rely on is the promises of God. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So when we talk about assurance of salvation, a second thing that we, that we have to point to is the finished work of Christ on the cross. The finished work of Christ on the cross. And just one passage of scripture I want us to look at here. And this is in Ephesians chapter 2. Again, there are tons of scriptures we could go to, but just this one passage in Ephesians 2 verses 4 through 8. Paul writes, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. And so that's why we need to look at the promises of God first and the finished work of Christ on the cross second, because uh, as Paul ended up in Ephesians 2 verse 8, this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. By grace you have been saved through faith, and so our salvation depends upon Christ. It depends upon his finished work on the cross. So we have to go there secondly. Do I trust that? Third thing we have to point to is the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit, as you see him in scripture, is the great convincer. The great convincer, John writes in 1 John 4.13, By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And he says in, in uh, the Gospel of John earlier that the Holy Spirit uh, will bear witness of Christ. He is the one who convinces that believers are believers. Because he has given us of his spirit, we ought to see something and know something has changed because the Holy Spirit indwells us. So there is the work of the Holy Spirit who is the great convincer. So do I believe these things? Do I affirm the record of the person and work of Jesus Christ, that he is God in the flesh? Do I believe that God saves sinners only through the merits of Christ's obedient life and his substitutionary death on the cross? So one more thing we have to look at here. Uh, in addition to those three, and that is this, the evidence of a new life. The evidence of a new life. Is my faith real? How can I know? How can I know? Well, 1 John uh, 5.13. Let's go to the book of 1 John together. So let's spend a little bit of time in 1 John. And we'll start in chapter 5. This is the right place to start. 1 John 5.13. This is where John gives his purpose for writing the letter of 1 John. 1 John 5.13, he says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. That's the thrust of what John is saying in that letter of 1 John. If you want to understand assurance of salvation, read the, first, the letter of 1 John. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And what John does in this letter is give a number of evidences, the evidence of a new life. So let's turn back to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. If we say we have fellowship with him, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Do I affirm the truths of scripture and desire to obey them? 
Let's go up to 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And 1 John 2, verse 1, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So uh, the second thing that we can pull from 1 John is, do I agree with God about my sin? We're looking at evidences of a new life uh, from 1 John. So first one is, do I affirm the truths of Scripture and desire to obey them? And then secondly, do I agree with God about my sin? Now, 1 John 2, verses 3 and 4 and by this, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. We can go to 1 John chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. By this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. So, we could say it like this, do I read scripture to understand and obey it? Or do I read scripture to win Bible trivia contests? But do I read scripture to understand and obey it? So we go back to 1 John chapter 2 again, verses 9 through 11. 1 John chapter 2, verse 9, whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. And then we can go up to 1 John 3, verse 10. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Verses 14 and 15. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Well, again, other verses on the same topic in 1 John we, we could go to, but the question is this, do I love God's people and desire to be with them? That is evidence of a new life. Do I love God's people and desire to be with them? Uh, 1 John chapter 2, verses 20 through 23. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you have all knowledge. I write to you, not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. And then we could go to uh, 1 John chapter 2, or I'm sorry, chapter 4, 1 John 4, verse 2. By this, you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And then down to verse 6 in chapter 4, we are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So we could ask this question, do I hold to sound doctrine? Do I hold to sound doctrine? Do I confess Christ as he is revealed in scripture? So there's a couple more, a couple more questions we can pull from some verses on uh, in 1 John to look at the evidence of a new life. Do I follow after holiness? Do I follow after holiness? Is that the direction of my life? First uh, John 2, verse 29, If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. And chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Do I follow after holiness. And then finally, uh, one more, do I give evidence that the Holy Spirit is in my life? Do I give evidence that the Holy Spirit is in my life? First John chapter 4, verse 13, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. First John 5, 10 and 11, whoever believes in the Son has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar 
because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son, and this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. So we could also, uh, along with those verses, look at the, uh, the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. But do I give evidence that the Holy Spirit is in my life by the lifestyle that I live and the confession I make and the truths that I hold to? Do I give evidence that the Holy Spirit is in my life? Okay, that's a quick, quick discussion on uh, assurance of salvation. That's not the point of the lesson today, but we're going to touch on that again a couple times. So I wanted to, wanted to hit that first. We're going to look today in Philemon at verses 4 through 7. Verses 4 through 7. Let's read that section once, uh, once again here. Philemon uh, verse 4. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. And in earlier lessons, we kind of introduced Philemon and uh, where he lived, what he was like, um, what he did, um, the church that was in his house, the church in Colossae, church of the Colossians, uh, where Philemon lived. So those are in earlier lessons. If you haven't listened to those, I would encourage you to, uh, to go back and, and uh, look at those first few lessons in this book. So that passage we just read, verses four through seven, there are three words that are repeated twice in that passage. And those three words are love, faith, and saints. Love, faith, and saints. Three words that are each repeated twice in that passage. So let's just do some observation here. What does the text say about love? So in other words, we're not drawing application here. We're not saying, what does this mean to me? What do I get out of this? We're saying, what does the text say about love? In Philemon verses four through seven, what can I observe in there that the text says about love? Because this is one of the words that's repeated twice. So it says that it is Philemon's love. Paul points to that uh, in, in uh, verse five and then in verse seven. Uh, we can say that love has an object and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. We can pull that out of here. Uh, but Paul has heard about Philemon's love from others. We can make that observation from the text about this word love. Paul has heard about Philemon's love from others. And then finally, Philemon's love has had an effect on Paul. So we, we see that in verse 7. So that's what the text says. We're just making some basic simple observations here. The first step in Bible study so let's ask the next question about the next word that's repeated, and that's the word faith. What does the text say about faith? Again, what can we see and just observe in these four verses about faith? Again, it's Philemon's faith that Paul points to. He talks about the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus. For all the saints, he talks about the sharing of your faith. Uh, it is faith in Christ. Paul says that makes that very clear. Uh, Paul has heard about Philemon's faith from others. Other people have been telling him about Philemon's faith. And as Philemon exercises his faith, it has an effect. And again, that uh, he talks about that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that's in us for the sake of Christ. So we have one other word that's repeated twice in this passage, and that's the word saints. And so again, what can we pull out of just this text here about the word saints as it's repeated twice? Well, saints are the object of Philemon's love. So that's fairly simple. We see that in there. Uh, Paul has heard from others about the impact Philemon's love has had on them. And Paul writes that all the saints have been recipients of Philemon's love. And that would, be, that would be not every saint the world over, but those who lived, the believers who lived in Colossae, where Philemon lived, have been recipients of Philemon's love. Uh, Paul goes on to say uh, that Philemon has refreshed the hearts of the saints, and Philemon has taken intentional and deliberate actions to encourage his fellow believers, his fellow saints. 
And then Paul makes this the foundation of his appeal. And we have to go down to verse 20 here. Verse 20, yes, brother, I want some benefit from you when the Lord refresh my heart in Christ. We'll see that, uh, that, that wording again here in our passage today, and we'll, we'll point back to that. So that's what the text says, just making observations about those three words that are repeated twice. And again, those will, be, those will be important as we go through this text and kind of break it down and dig into it a little bit more. So let's hit our outline of Paul's letter. I like to do this every time because it helps us kind of keep things um, in, in order in our minds, helps us see the flow of Paul's thinking as he writes this letter. And it gives us some little handles to hang on to as we kind of break the letter down into short chunks that we can grasp. So verses one, two, and three that we looked at last time is Paul's introduction to his, letters, his letter to Philemon. Verses four through seven, our text for this lesson is Paul's thanksgiving and prayer for Philemon. Verses eight through 16 is Paul's appeal to Philemon. Verses 17 through 22 is Paul's confidence in Philemon. And then at the end of the letter, verses 23 through 25 are Paul's final greetings and prayer for Philemon. So here's where we're gonna go today in, in verses four through seven as we look at Paul's thanksgiving and prayer since that's the, what the outline point is, that's what's in the text. It's Paul's thanksgiving and prayer. So we'll look at those two things. We'll look at Paul's thanksgiving for Philemon, what he says, why he gives it. And then we'll look at Paul's prayer for Philemon, what he prays and why he prayed that for Philemon. So that's where we're going today. We could also title this, this text, this section, we could call it Philemon's Love for the Saints. And I think you got a sense of that as we read through there and looked at those three words that are repeated here. Uh, Paul, uh, Philemon's love for the saints. Paul sees in Philemon a genuine love for the saints, one of the evidences of a genuine faith in Christ. So let's start out looking at Paul's thanksgiving for Philemon. Paul's thanksgiving for Philemon in verse four. Paul says, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers. That's Paul's thanksgiving for Philemon. So let's just stop here for a second and let's ask ourselves a question. Do we do that too? Is that a regular practice of mine when I pray? Do I think about other saints and give thanks for them when I pray? I mean, that would be a good thing to do. Well, again, just a, a quick little application there. Do I do that too? Do I think about other believers when I'm praying and give thanks for them? Well, the, it's interesting too that the very things that Paul gives thanks for, and we'll see that when we get to verse five, the very things that Paul gives thanks for are the very same things that he wanted to see Philemon act on toward Onesimus. So he talks about Philemon's love, the faith that he has toward the Lord Jesus, his love for all the saints. Those very things that Paul gives thanks for are the very things he wants to see Philemon act on again toward Onesimus, but this time it's going to be harder. This time it's going to be harder. The very things that Paul gave thanks to God for were going to be stretched in a way they had not been before. You know, and we can, we can pull another little point of application out of there, a little observation that we never arrive in godliness. I never reach a place where I can't grow and be stretched further. There is always more growing and stretching God can do in me to teach me his character, his attributes. We never arrive in godliness. Philemon's love for all the saints, for all the saints, Paul points to. I hear of your love and the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. Well, is that going to extend to one more? Would he extend that to one other person? And that would be his runaway slave who stole from him on the way out the door and who then became a believer in Rome. That's Onesimus. Would he extend that love for all the saints to one more? Would his faith in Christ 
allow him to welcome as a full brother one who was considered in Roman culture property, a non-person, one who had run away from him and stolen from him. John Calvin, in his commentary on this text, he writes, even the most perfect so long as they live in the world, never have so good ground for congratulations as not to need prayers that God may grant to them not only to persevere till the end, but likewise to make progress from day to day. So that's what Paul is pointing to here is Philemon, is he making progress in godliness? Is his love, uh, is his love that he has for all the saints being stretched now in a way it's never been stretched before. Uh, this was not going to be easy for Philemon to do, and we'll talk about that again more in, in subsequent lessons. So Paul mentions two things that he gives thanks for. His verse 5, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. How did Paul know about Philemon's love and faith? Well, he was obviously a friend of his, so he knew something. We see that in the letter. That, that seems to be clear in the letter. But other people were telling him, as they came to visit Paul, they were telling him about Philemon, about his love and his faith. I hear of your love, which must mean that Philemon's life was pretty consistent. He lived this out pretty consistently to the point where other people noticed and over time he gained a reputation. Other people were coming to Paul and telling him about Philemon's love and his faith. And uh, that's, that's pretty impressive that he lived that consistently, that he gained that reputation for someone who displayed the love of Christ and displayed and lived out of a faith, a genuine faith in Christ. So who would have come to talk to Paul? Well, it's very possible that one of them could have been Pastor Epaphras of the Colossians, and Colossians 1, 7, Paul calls him a beloved fellow servant of Paul's. He was the one, Epaphras was the one who planted the church at Colossae, uh, where Philemon lived, and according again to Colossians 1, 7, Epaphras was a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, on behalf of the saints in Colossae. And Paul writes in Colossians 4.12 that Epaphras was a faithful uh, minister of Christ on your behalf and who struggles on your behalf in his prayers that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. That was Pastor Epaphras from the, the church at Colossae. A good man, a true shepherd. It's very, very possible that Paul heard about Philemon's love and faith from him. So... Let's just take a look for a second at Paul giving thanks for the saints. So I want us to look at several verses. We'll hit these fairly quickly. Uh, you can turn to them if you're quick. Um, I will give you at least the references. And um, I have them written down on a sheet of paper here. So it makes it a little bit faster to get through these. All I want us to do is just feel the weight of what Paul is doing. I want you to hear some of the words that Paul writes when he gives thanks for the saints. And I want those words to sink in because we asked the question earlier, do I do that? Do I give thanks for other believers when I am in prayer? This was a consistent practice of Paul's. So let's look at this. Romans 1, 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. We can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4 through 6. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you. Then we turn to Paul's letter to the Ephesians. In Ephesians 1.15, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, uh, then he goes on to pray after that, but he's heard about your faith and love, and he mentions that in his letter. Uh, Philippians 1, verses 3 through 5, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. 
when we go up to Paul's letter to the Colossians, which was where Philemon lived. Colossians 1, 3 through 5, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, same two things that he commends Philemon for. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven of this, you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel. We turn to Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, his first letter to the Thessalonians. First Thessalonians verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. We go to Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians 1, 3. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Then we can go to Paul's second letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy 1, 3 through 5. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers, night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith. And then uh, the last one here is the verse we've, we've just read, Philemon, verses 4 and 5. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. So what conclusion can we draw from that? Again, I just want us to kind of feel the weight of that, that this is a, a consistent practice of Paul's when he prays, is to give thanks for the saints. Well, you know, none of the people that Paul wrote to were perfect. They were redeemed sinners just like he was, but he intentionally focused on those things that were evidence of the genuine work of grace in their hearts. He saw Christ in them and he gave thanks to God for that. Some of them may not have meshed with him personality-wise, right? But what he was doing was focusing on those things that were the evidence of the genuine work of grace in their hearts. And we could even point to things like 1 Corinthians when uh, Paul had uh, when Paul wrote that letter, it had some very um, strong, deep concerns about the church in Corinth and some big issues. But then he starts out saying, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. When Paul gives thanks, he points to the things in them that God has done. He sees Christ in them even if he had to look for a while to see it, but he gives thanks to God for that. So that's Paul's thanksgiving for Philemon. Here's his prayer for Philemon, verse six. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. That's his prayer for Philemon. So we have to ask this question, what in the world does this phrase mean? He says, I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. When Paul says the sharing of your faith, what's he talking about? What's he talking about? The sharing of your faith. Is he talking about evangelism? The answer to that question is no. He is not talking about evangelism. That has gotten to be a phrase that we always use for evangelism. And it's a good phrase to use about sharing your faith with someone. But that's not what Paul's talking about here. He's not talking about evangelism. How do we know that? Well, we look at the words. The word sharing here in the Greek is the Greek word koinonia. And the Greek word means fellowship, communion, participation, sharing. And the Baptist meaning of koinonia is potluck. Well, no, not exactly, but we do like our potlucks. So uh, anyway, the Greek meaning of the word koinonia, the word sharing that's translated there in our English version, is fellowship, communion, participation, sharing. Paul uses that word koinonia thir some 13 times in his letters, along with other forms of the word. He uses that word for the sharing of material things, like uh, uh, saints took uh, up collections uh, of money, 
for the poor saints, for example, in Jerusalem. And you see that in Romans 15, 26, 2 Corinthians 8, 4. Um, you see Paul talking about uh, sharing here. Romans 15, 26, from Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. 2 Corinthians 8, 4, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. So the Greek word is in there. The Greek word koinonia is in there. Uh, the English translation doesn't really reflect it as much. But he uses that Greek word there for the sharing of material things. Uh, the word uh, is also used in Philippians 2.1. He uses it to refer to the way that believers should think about each other. He says, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from all of any participation, there's the word there, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, and make my joy complete. So he uses that to refer to the way that believers ought to think about each other. Because if they've seen that, then we recognize that. So he uses this word also, koinonia, to refer to a really unique fellowship shared between believers in Christ. 1 Corinthians 1, 9, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the word fellowship there is this word koinonia. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son. Really unique, unique relationship there. Paul speaks about his uh, his koinonia, his sharing or participation in the sufferings of Christ. Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And he talks about the, the fellowship of the spirit. Um, all the saints greet you, that the word is in there. Um, and so he speaks of his fellowship, um, his sharing, uh, and his participation in the sufferings of Christ, and then the fellowship of the Spirit that the saints share. And he talks in Philippians 1.5 about the partnership that he and the Philippians had in spreading the gospel. Philippians 1.5, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And then he says we should have no koinonia with darkness, no sharing, participation, fellowship with darkness. 2 Corinthians 6.14, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? He uses the word twice there, and uh, just to make the point that believers, you know, we should have no fellowship sharing participation in darkness. And then he uses the same word again, as we, we've seen in in um, Philemon verse 6, talks talking about the sharing of your faith. So the thought there is that Paul is praying that Philemon's participation in or expression of his faith in community with believers would result in something. I pray that the sharing, the participation, the fellowship, the, ex the, the expressing of your faith in community with believers may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. So it's praying that, that Philemon's participation in, expression of, sharing in, community of, of uh, um, participation in faith in the community with believers would result in something. So what's it supposed to result in? What does the sharing of your faith mean for Philemon? What's it mean? Well, Philemon doesn't know this yet because he hasn't read the rest of the letter by this point, you know. But we've read the rest of the letter, so we kind of get where Paul is going. For Philemon to participate in or express genuine faith among the community of believers would be to now think of his former slave property, Onesimus, no longer as a bondservant but as a beloved brother. So in verse six, what Paul is doing here is he's laying the groundwork for the request that he's gonna make of Philemon in verses 16 and 17, where he's gonna tell him, receive him as you would receive me. So Paul's laying the groundwork here, saying, I pray that this, uh, this sharing, this fellowship, this, this faith that you participate in may become effective, may produce something, and, uh, and so the thing that is going to produce 
is that Paul is looking toward is this receiving of, of this former slave now, not as a slave anymore, but as a full blow, a beloved brother in Christ. There's a, a form of this same Greek word, uh, koinonia, um, that shows up in verse 17. So if you would consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. That's a form of that same word. And uh, so what does it look like for me? We could ask the question, what does it look like for me to show my faith in Christ through love within the community of believers, within the church, the gathered church, the community of believers? How do I express or show my faith? What kinds of things do I do? What do I do? Do I build relationships with people? Do I show love and, and community with people that I might not really like a whole lot or people who don't look like me or who maybe don't smell real good or don't dress like I do or don't act Christianly like I think maybe they ought to act, you know, as good American Christians. Well, what does it look like for me to show my faith in community? We can see what it was gonna look like for Philemon. What about us? What does that look like for us? It's a good question to ask and think about. So, and we kind of have a, a, a grip on what the first part of verse six is saying. He's laying the groundwork in his prayer for the request that he's gonna make of Philemon a little bit later. What in the world now does the second part of this prayer mean? I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. What in the world is he talking about there? Well, when Philemon responds and receives back his former slave property, now as a beloved brother, when he responds in the forgiving, welcoming, transforming, redeeming love of Christ, that will have an effect. When Onesimus shows up at the door and knocks on the door and Philemon opens it and there's Onesimus standing there, his former slave who ran away, who stole from him on the way out the door. Now he's standing there as a brother in Christ. How is Philemon going to respond? When he responds in the forgiving, welcoming, transforming, redeeming love of Christ, that will have an effect. It will result in something. It will be effective. As Paul says here, that your faith, the sharing of your faith may become effective as you, as you display or exercise this faith that you have in Christ by receiving Onesimus back as a beloved brother in Christ. As you do that, then I pray that that would become effective for the full knowledge or would result in uh, the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. The Greek word there for effective is the same root word we get our English word energy from. It's going to have a powerful result. Powerful result. So here's what it would be powerful for. Paul says, for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ, which means what? Well, one more time. When Philemon acts, in forgiving, reconciling love toward his former slave Onesimus, something's gonna happen inside of Philemon's own heart. It's gonna be a full knowledge, a deepening understanding, a comprehension, an experience, an experiential knowledge of, as Paul says, every good thing that is in us. So what are the good things that are in us? What are the good things that are in us? Well, I kind of summarized here, um, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. I would encourage you to maybe write that uh, reference down. And when we're done here, to take just a minute and read that passage through slowly, maybe a couple of times. Read it through slowly and let the words sink in. Let the weight of it sink in. So I kind of summarized it here just to pull out um, what I think are the things that Paul is pointing to. But Paul wants uh, Philemon to know in a deeper way of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. What are the good things that are in us? Let me summarize Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. In him, we have obtained an inheritance. We were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. Every one of those things is just mind-blowing, astonishing, stunning. So those are some of the good things that are in us for the sake of Christ. Those are the things that Paul said, you know, Philemon, as you exercise your faith in this way and you show this love to Onesimus, it's going to result in a greater understanding for you of what Christ has done for you and in you. So let me, let me maybe kind of illustrate it like this. What's the best way to learn something? Best way to learn something. So years ago, when we first got a Volkswagen, a little Volkswagen Super Beetle, I went to the library because I hadn't had that much experience with Volkswagens, Volkswagen engines, really none. So I went down to the library here and I just checked out every book that they had on Volkswagen maintenance, every book I could find. I checked it out and I read them through, read the whole thing through. So uh, there was a lot of, obviously a lot of repetition in those books, but I just read those books through, okay? Every book I could find on Volkswagen maintenance. That was a great start, okay? That was a great foundation of knowledge. But then later on, when I completely tore down piece by piece and then completely rebuilt an engine, a Volkswagen engine, you know, now I know what every single part looks like and what it does. Before, I'd read about them in a book and I could recognize them. I had some theoretical knowledge of what they did, how they all worked together. But once I tore that engine down, with that knowledge already there, once I tore that engine down piece by piece and rebuilt it literally piece by piece, split the block, um, new pistons, everything, new bearings, everything. Now I know what every single part does and what it looks like and how they interact together. So let's, let's kind of take that illustration and let it play out like this. Had Philemon, the guy that Paul is writing to, had he been forgiven of his sins? Absolutely. He was a believer in Christ. Philemon knew it. Paul knew it. Yes, he had been forgiven of his sins. But you know what? When he stood there at the door with Onesimus standing there in front of him, his former slave who had run away, stolen from him, and when he forgave him and he charged what Onesimus owed to Paul's account and he fully accepted Onesimus without reservation as a beloved brother in Christ now, he knew forgiveness in a way that he had never known it before. Yes, he, he knew forgiveness of his sins and he appreciated that, but now he was living it out in a way that he never had before. He was doing what Jesus had done in a way that he had never had to do before. Philemon had to do what Paul wrote in the letter to Philemon's church, in the letter to the Colossians, he, Paul wrote in Colossians 3, verses 12 through 14, Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive and above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. That little phrase in there just grips you. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Just like Jesus had forgiven unconditionally. Paul writes to Philemon's church, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Philemon would have heard that letter read as the church gathered on a Sunday. That's a high standard. That's the forgiveness that is supposed to characterize the love of believers in the church. That's supposed to characterize the love of a husband and wife. 
you know, that display of the gospel with that kind of love, that degree of love, that depth of love, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. So Philemon would learn of forgiveness and adoption and redemption and grace in a much deeper way. Like Paul wrote, I pray that the sharing of your faith as you exercise that love and that forgiveness toward Onesimus, that that would become effective, that would result in the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ, that his understanding of forgiveness and adoption, redemption and grace, man would just explode in a way that they never had before. So, why did Paul pray for Philemon? Why did he pray? Verse 7, For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. That's why Paul prayed. Paul, even in his imprisonment, derived much joy and comfort from the love that Philemon showed because he kept hearing, you know, kept hearing about from other believers that would come from Colossae and would come to visit Paul and they would talk about Philemon. And so Paul, even there as he was in prison, was deriving much joy and comfort from the love that Philemon showed among, among the church at Colossae. And so he puts it this way, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. The hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. And that word refreshed means to rest or to cease from toil. That's the effect that Philemon had on the saints in the church at Colossae. They, when they were around him, they could rest. It's like they could cease for a little bit from their toil. It's like Matthew 11, verses 28 and 29, when Jesus says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So Philemon was a refresher of hearts, kind of like Jesus was. The people in, in Philemon's community, believers there who were exhausted, struggling, weak, suffering, hurting, whatever it was they were going through, just like people go through in churches now, but the ones who were going through that stuff, Philemon helped them to rest. He eased their burden. He brought rest and renewal and refreshing. Well, let's just take a run through scripture again and let's look at refreshing hearts because this is something that shows up from time to time in scripture. So I want us to, again, we're gonna take a quick run through a number of passages of scripture and it might be easier for you if you want to just to write these references down. I'll give them to you uh, before I read them. And you might uh, want to read them later and spend a little bit more time thinking about them. We start back first in Jeremiah chapter 31. I'm going to take a quick look at refreshing hearts throughout Scripture. Jeremiah 31 verses 10 through 14. Jeremiah writes, Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the coastlands far away. Say, He who scattered Israel will gather him and will keep him as a shepherd keeps his flock. For the Lord has ransomed Jacob and has redeemed him from hands too strong for him. They shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion, and they shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord, over the grain, the wine, the oil, and over the young of the flock and the herd. Their life shall be like a watered garden, and they shall languish no more. Then shall the young women rejoice in the dance, and the young men and the old shall be merry. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. I will feast the soul of the priests with abundance, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, declares the Lord. And there's God talking to his people who were in captivity, but who he would restore. And then even later on, uh, what was this going to look like? God says, my people shall be satisfied with my goodness. God himself is a refresher of hearts. Jeremiah, also Jeremiah 31, uh, down a little bit in verses 23 through 25. Jeremiah 31, 23 through 25. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, once more, they shall use these words in the land of Judah and in its cities 
when I restore their fortunes. The Lord bless you, O habitation of righteousness, O holy hill. And Judah and all its cities shall dwell there together, and the farmers and those who wander with their flocks, for I will satisfy the weary soul, and every languishing soul I will replenish. Look what God takes upon himself as responsibility there. I will satisfy the weary soul. Every languishing soul I will replenish. Our God is a refresher of hearts. Proverbs 11.25 Proverbs 11.25, whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and one who waters will himself be watered. One who waters will himself be watered. That's a beautiful picture of being a refresher of hearts. We go up to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, verses 30 through 32. Paul writes, I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. And so Paul writes to the church in Rome. He says, so that by God's will, I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. Paul realized, you know what? I need this too. I need this too. Paul was a tireless servant of Christ, but he realized every once in a while, man, I need some refreshing too. So he writes that to the, the Romans. We go to 1 Corinthians 16, verse 18. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 18, Paul writes, For they refreshed my spirit as well as yours. Give recognition to such people. And I realize we're pulling a, a sentence there, kind of out of context and, and uh, about half the sentence. But, uh, but just the thought there, they refreshed my spirit as well as yours. Give recognition to such people. I like how Paul says that. Give recognition to those people who are refreshers of hearts. That's a unique and a beautiful ministry among the body of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 13. 2 Corinthians 7, 13. Therefore, we are comforted, and besides our own comfort, we rejoiced still more at the joy of Titus, because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. Paul's co-worker, Titus, who again was a, a tireless servant of Christ and of the gospel, when he came to visit the Corinthians was refreshed, was refreshed by the Corinthians. And Paul rejoices that now Titus is expressing joy. We rejoice still more the joy of Titus because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. The Corinthians re refreshed Titus, and now he was giving joy, and that was spreading. Paul was rejoicing because Titus now, even though he may have been still tired, was refreshed. Second Timothy chapter 1. I love this verse too. Second Timothy 1 verse 16. May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my change. We really know very little at all about Onesiphorus, and yet we do know this, that he was a refresher of hearts. So that tells us a lot about who and what he was. May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me, often refreshed me, and was not ashamed of my chains. Well, that's a, a quick look at the refreshers of hearts throughout Scripture. What do you suppose Philemon did? Uh, Paul says that um, the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. What do you suppose he did? Well, the text doesn't really say exactly, explicitly. Well, let's just think then, what do we do? How can we refresh hearts? How can we refresh hearts? I mean, we could, we could draw out all kinds of things, just a few real quick. Maybe you could ask somebody, how can I pray for you? How can I pray for you? Or maybe share a scripture with somebody that has been uh, blessing you. Send a text to somebody. That's a cool thing to do every once in a while. Just fire off a bunch of texts to believers on your contact list um, and, and share with them a verse that's really meant a lot to you recently. 
So make sure you're praying for people. Pray for the saints. Give thanks for them. How about sending out cards? Now, that's a cool ministry. I mean, to get a card in the mail from somebody, nobody sends letters anymore. To get a card in the mail, really a unique personal touch to say, I'm praying for you. Uh, this verse meant a lot to me. I hope it encourages you. Just something really simple. Uh, there's a ton of ways that we can uh, refresh people. Take them some cookies. You know, I mean, whatever else. A lot of things you can do. What do we do? How are we refreshing hearts? How are we pointing people back to the love of Jesus, Christ on the cross, and refreshing their hearts? So one other thought to remember here, everybody needs a refreshed heart from time to time. I mean, we just do. We got to remember that refreshment is temporary. Notice what Paul said to Timothy, may the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me. He often refreshed me. It's not a one-time shot. You know, we go through life and we're encouraged for a while, and then, man, we hit a dry spot. You know, I, I read a quote earlier by John Bunyan, who wrote that phenomenal book, Pilgrim's Progress. He says that sometimes, I'm just paraphrasing here, sometimes the scripture is to me just full and exciting. And then he goes on to say, that sometimes it comes across to me as dry as a stick. Even John Bunyan had those dry times. There are times when we just are dry. That happens to all of us, it happens to me. We need refreshers of hearts. That's what the body of Christ needs. So think about how can I be a refresher of hearts? Watch and pray for the saints. There will be some who need more refreshment than others, maybe a little more uh, frequently than others, depending on the season of life that they're in, but all need some. Everybody needs refreshers of hearts. Praise God for that unique ministry of being a refresher of hearts, something we can all do. But some, like Philemon, are, I think are uniquely gifted to do that. So we're going to let William Barclay land the plane today. William Barclay was a pastor and an author. And he, he writes about this text, and, and specifically this phrase about Philemon as a refresher of hearts. And I really like what he says. William Barclay says, quote, Philemon was a man whose faith in Christ and whose love to the brethren all men knew, and the story of them had reached even Rome, where Paul was in prison. His house, Philemon's house, must have been like an oasis in a desert, for, as Paul had it, he had refreshed the hearts of God's people. It is a lovely thing to go down to history as a man in whose house God's people were, were rested and refreshed. Now let me read that last sentence again. I think it's so beautiful and so powerful. Barclay writes, It is a lovely thing to go down to history as a man in whose house God's people were rested and refreshed. That is a lovely thing. I like the way he says that. A lovely thing to go down to history, like Philemon did, as a man in whose house God's people were rested and refreshed. We don't know much about Philemon. We know a few things, but that's a, a significant one. That's a huge thing that we know about Philemon. That's how he has gone down to, in history here as a refresher of hearts. It would be a good legacy to leave. How cool would it be uh, after we have died to go down remembered as someone who refreshed the hearts of the saints. So pray to be, pray to be a refresher of hearts and pray for those who refresh hearts and pray for those whose hearts need to be refreshed in Christ. Well, that was our, our next lesson in our little, uh, our, our look through Paul's short letter to Philemon verses four through seven. We'll hit the rest of the book as we go, but that's plenty to chew on for now. So I'll leave you with that, with that consideration ringing in your ears of how can I be a refresher of hearts. Thanks for stopping by, and we'll see you next time.